This is the uh, alternative book launch. You could call it the alt launch. Um, all of you know the backstory on why we're here. I just called Brian as soon as I had learned that there were some other troubles with the other um, location, politics and prose, who are here. And I think we should also uh, give politics and prose a round of applause for supporting this event. Um, they um, faced a braying mob, and that's why I brought Ben here as my personal security to defend me. I've been lifting, you can probably tell. Um, yeah, and we're, you know, we're here to talk about the most dangerous book in DC, um, which is my book, The Management of Savagery. Um, for those of you who don't know, Ben and I have been doing a podcast called Moderate Rebels. That's a term that comes up in the book a lot. Um, obviously, it's used ironically in the context of our podcast. And uh, this is a live taping of Moderate Rebels, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Ben has been a... Um, sort of off and on staff writer of the Gray Zone um, since, what, 2017. And uh, that's when we started really coming under attack from the same forces that appear on the pages of my book and which lobbied to basically cancel my entire book tour uh, in the online version of a book burning. Um, so Ben uh, has really contributed, I think, to uh, opening up the discussion on regime change wars and how humanitarian interventionist propaganda is deployed. Um, and um, Ben, I don't know if you want to. Well, I think it's also a reflection of the fact, and we'll get to this later on, but the people actively lobbying for the US government to wage war on Syria, among other nations, they have resorted to trying to ban books that they find that they dislike. And, and that's a reflection of the fact that, one, that some of those wars have failed, but also that we're in a moment in which we're in an information war, and journalism is no longer seen as something to inform the public to help them make better decisions about their lives and, and govern society, but it's seen as warfare. And if you report facts that they don't like, you're acting on behalf of some government, et cetera, or some interest. And that's what Max's book is about. So one of the things we want to do with this conversation is we're going to keep it kind of conversational. We're also going to welcome input from the audience at different points. Um, and we're going to try to keep it more fun, right? Because we don't want to just have a book event where, you know, it's just Max bloviating and, and you listening. We want, we want like you to like all my other book events, like every other book event ever. So, uh, and and also because there's a sense of humor in the, the book itself. I mean, if you know Max, you'll probably know that he's he's basically a failed comedian, but he's he's still pretty funny. Uh, and uh, you know, so we you can see that in in the book. You can see that in our show, Moderate Rebels. You can see that in his writing. And uh, I guess we'll go ahead and start. And, and one of the things we want to do beginning is just kind of reflect on the moment we're in right now. And I think, you know, what's funny is in the era of Trumpism, liberals have kind of co-opted this idea that this is not normal, right? But I think we should reflect on the fact that we are in a very bizarre time. And this book encapsulates just how bizarre this is, where we have former national security state officials who are responsible for the deaths of millions of people for orchestrating the Iraq war, for orchestrated countless other wars, who are now being seen and portrayed as members of the progressive resistance against Donald Trump, right? And ironically, these are the same figures who have helped to give birth to Donald Trump, to give birth to the far right and these other forces that have metastasized, not just throughout the US, but through Europe and, and much of the world. Max's book really encapsulates that rather succinctly, it might not seem like I did 400 pages, but actually he spells out conflict by conflict how this has happened. And, and we see it right now today, just thinking about what's going on with Russiagate. You know, Russiagate has collapsed. Robert Mueller, the special counsel, has been unable to find evidence proving collusion between Trump and the Russian government. And this narrative was relied on for two years now by the Democratic Party, by the Hillary Clinton campaign and others as this kind of cudgel to prevent any movement to the left, to attack progressive critics, and to portray anyone who is critical of the neoliberal democratic establishment as some kind of Russian agent. And now that that has come collapsing down, we can see very clearly that this narrative the entire time was a national security state narrative being pushed by US intelligence services. So we're going to start there and talk about how his book you know, go, we're going to go through the different conflicts, the war in Afghanistan in the 1980s, uh, the Gulf War, the Iraq War, the war in Syria. And these are all inextricably linked, of course. But to think about the time we're in right now, 
went with Donald Trump, this far-right billionaire reality TV show president, the intelligence agencies and the Democratic Party have resorted to rehabilitating the national security state. So maybe we can start there, Max, talking about this moment we're in before we go to understand the historical context that led us here. Yeah, I think that Russia Gate, which is you know partially collapsed, but which still will continue on and which will be inevitably used to uh, suppress the popularity of Bernie Sanders, um, is uh, the, pr the product of a confluence of factors. And you know most people who have been Russiagate skeptics have been really good at pointing out the uh, the role of MSNBC in kind of becoming the Fox News for Democrats, propagandizing people night after night with Rachel Maddow warning that Russia can actually turn off our heat in the winter. Um, and that's the easy stuff. That emanated from you know, the Hillary Clinton campaign where we know from this meeting in the book Shattered, which is an insider's account of the Hillary campaign and its collapse, um, that Robbie Mook and these other um, characters basically decided to push the Russiagate narrative uh, immediately and blame Russian hackers, WikiLeaks, and um, I think there was something else that didn't really relate to the reality of their failure. Um, but this was also a counterintelligence operation. Um, we've now learned, now that George Papadopoulos, who is sort of like Trump's coffee boy, you know, the Trump campaign was a pirate ship and you had all these bizarre characters from Papadopoulos, who I used to think was Webster's dad, <laughs> if you're young enough to remember the TV show Webster, uh, to um, um, Sebastian Gorka, you know, who appears on election night wearing a Vitezi Rend uh, Hungarian fascist outfit. <laughs> Nazi collaborator. He's sort of like. supporting a Nazi collaborator as <laughs> a character who basically faked his PhD in so many ways. We'll talk about that later, and he appears in the pages of my book. But Papadopoulos actually talks about how as soon as he became attached to the Trump campaign, he was approached by mysterious figures like George Mifsud, um, who I think Elizabeth Lee of Oz has demonstrated pretty conclusively uh, is likely an MI5 asset. Um, and Stefan Halper, a confidential FBI and CIA asset, were inserted into the Trump campaign. Um, you actually had uh, Carter Page spied on by the NSA on the basis of the Christopher Steele dossier, which according to one of its longtime proponents, my, the journalist Michael Isakoff, is basically a bunch of bunk. Uh, it's basically been exposed as bunk, but those of us who read it knew it. We knew it was bunk from the beginning. That's why we became kind of the Russiagate skeptics, because we knew there was never going to be a conclusive finding by Mueller of collusion. And then you have the neocons, figures like uh, William Crystal, Bill Crystal, uh, who has been, you know, had his reputation rehabilitated thanks to Russia Gate. On MSNBC, he was hanging out with Fat Joe. Yeah, Ari Melber, Ari Melber, a guy I used to work with at The Nation, is seen on MSNBC hyping up woke Bill Crystal, and they're bobbing their heads to hip hop along with the faded rapper Fat Joe riding through downtown New York. And it's like the master of the macabre in Iraq who has blood on his hands is now woke Bill Crystal, according to this progressive I used to work with. This is you know, what Russiagate has done for Crystal. But I write about in my afterword, which is about Russiagate and the role of Syria in Russiagate, I write about how Bill Crystal in 2014 was fretting about a war-weary public. The American public was not supportive enough of war, and he said that there needed to be a rallying uh, in the pages of the Weekly Standard, which is now defunct and uh, resuscitated thanks to the billions of Piero Midiar in a different form. Um, and Bill Crystal had an outfit in town called the Foreign Policy Initiative, which was the reboot of the Project for a New American Century, which provided a home for a lot of the Iraq War ideologues. And in one of the first stories I did on the revival of the Cold War back in 2014, I wrote about the Foreign Policy Initiative orchestrating the resignation of an RT anchor who was previously unknown, Liz Wall, uh, through uh, its fellow Jamie Kerchick, who's another kind of middling neocon in town working under Crystal's watch. And they orchestrated this resignation on RT in order to essentially make RT a target of a counterintelligence investigation, which culminated with its registration as a foreign agent. Um, and this was, to me, one of the opening shots in the new Cold War. It followed um, the coup in Maidan, which led to the annexation of Crimea after a referendum in which over 
of Crimeans who are Russian speakers voted to join Russia. Uh, but the, you know, something was brewing. And so Russiagate was sort of inevitable in many ways, and Trump really made it possible, partly because he was speaking a non-interventionist language on the campaign trail. I think Steve Bannon recognized that the Rust Belt voters and the people in Ohio and Michigan, the workers, the supposed work, white working class, who bore the moral injury of the war in Iraq would respond if someone took down the Bush family, would respond if someone openly trashed John McCain, who's actually not liked by a lot of all Vietnam veterans. And they did. And they responded when Trump countered Hillary Clinton, who called for a no-fly zone in Syria, which she privately admitted in one of her Goldman Sachs paid talks would kill a lot of Syrians. And Trump said, we don't even know who we're arming in Syria. Trump got, he tapped into the, the strong non and anti-interventionism of middle America, and that scared the hell out of the managers of savagery in Washington. So Russiagate served the purpose of domesticating Trump, first removing Michael Flynn as his national security advisor, uh, not exactly a figure who I would describe as a non-interventionist or necessarily a sane individual. But Flynn, how was, how was he dimed out? Well, the NSA was, was listening to him, I think an NSA official informed someone like Lisa Page or Sally Yates, who then went to, Dave, um, to uh, the Washington Post columnist David Ignatius, who wrote about a US official writing about Michael Flynn talking with the Russian ambassador. And the American public gets the sense, especially you know, liberals who are you know, already hepped up on you know, Russophobia, that Flynn is having this secret conversation with the Russian ambassador about collusion about selling out the American public, which they've been hearing about. In fact, what Flynn was talking about with Sergei Kislyak was Israel and protecting Israel at the UN. Flynn had called Kislyak on behalf of Jared Kushner, who is himself acting as the sort of Sherpa of Benjamin Netanyahu, to ask him to block a vote, to, to ask him to uh, be the deciding vote because Obama was going to abstain at the UN on that Security Council vote on Israeli settlements. And so it was all about Israel, and it's all about Israel Gate, but the American public didn't know that for over a year. So Flynn is replaced with H.R. McMaster. Who's H.R. McMaster? I mean, he's the perfect representative of the national security state, someone who emerged under the watch of David Petraeus, a counterinsurgency expert, someone who favors you know, more tanks, more uh, you know, land, land wars, conventional wars, someone who uh, was leaking on Trump, uh, up until the day he was fired. And so you see the gradual domestication of the Trump administration under the narrative of Russiagate to the point where he's surrounded by the very same Bush neocons that he had campaigned against down to Elliot Abrams. Um, so we can come back to that, but I think Russiagate has played a really um, negative role for those of us who actually favor peace, a word you very rarely hear in presidential campaigns anymore. I think only one candidate Tulsi Gabbard uses that word. I rarely hear Bernie use it. Um, but also Russiagate has proven the point of my book, which is that the national security state helps the far right again and again and again. And what have they done by putting all their eggs in the collusion basket and building everything up to Mueller's report is they've helped Trump because now Trump, in the words of his former campaign manager, and Chief of Staff Steve Bannon is going to go full animal on his opponents now that William, now that Mueller essentially has concluded that there was no there was no collusion and recommended no indictments and essentially made all of Trump's most fervent foes look like a bunch of conspiracy theorists, which they were all along. So once again, they've helped Trump. I think Trump is the favorite to win re-election in the upcoming election. And if he does win, all the people that put all their eggs in Mueller's basket and made Mueller into like this national sex symbol to the point where the New Yorker was featuring photographs of him and talking about his Brooks Brothers suit and what cologne he wears. Those people will bear responsibility for Trump's reelection when they could have been talking about class issues, economic issues, Trump's racism, his war on immigrants. They could have been talking about the, his dastardly coup in Venezuela. They could have been talking about uh, his, his cruel sanctions on Iran and the destabilization of the Middle East. They could have been talking about Trump appointing Herman Cain to the Fed, the basically godfather pizza CEO is gonna run the Fed. 
I mean, this, this buffoonery has all been covered in a narrative that has brought us to a new Cold War. Yeah, and this is why we begin with this, because this is only, again, further confirmation of the thesis of Max's book, which is that the U.S. national security state, which, which we can understand, you know, there's been this discussion recently of what the people call the deep state, as if this is a new concept. This has, of course, been around for, for many decades. It's referred to many other countries, Turkey and famously, but other countries. Many states have a deep state, which is really how you maintain a, a governing apparatus, especially when you're an empire, in between different heads of state. So the Pentagon, the CIA, all these institutions have people who stay within, largely within their office from term to term. They're seen as kind of apolitical parts, ma maintainers, apparatchiks, right, who maintain the apparatus of the US empire. And the point is that these people who work within the US national security state have for years supported on and off far-right forces throughout the world. And now those forces have come back to bite, not just us, but of course many of the people that the US has targeted. So I think one of, another ways, one of the other ways we can get into that topic is talking about the title of the book. Um, because you know, this is actually a very interesting topic. Um, I'm gonna quote from part of the book. Uh, this title, The Management of Savagery, is, is from a, a paper, it's a paper written by, a, it's a pseudonym by a Salafi Jihadi uh, kind of uh, theorist, if you will. Ideologue. It went by Abu Bakr Najib. Many suspect it was actually Ayman al-Zawahiri who wrote this, um, but it was authored under the name of an Iraqi Salafi ide Jihadi ideologue. And you can talk more about it, but Max writes, and I think this really encapsulates what he, we just talked about with Russiagate, but also with the other issues we'll talk about. Uh, Max pointed out that this, this Salafi paper, The Management of Savagery, quote, dovetailed neatly with the regime change blueprints conceived by national security hardliners in Washington. And it hints at the symbiotic relationship that these two extremist elements have enjoyed. In Libya and Syria, where the CIA provided arms and equipment to jihadist insurgents, this ideological symbiosis was consolidated through direct collaboration. But as I will demonstrate in the coming pages, savagery by its very definition cannot be managed. In fact, it has already found its way back home. What do you mean by that, Max? Well, when I talk about this document, I first kind of analyze the strategy behind it, which is to move beyond uh, what Al-Qaeda's traditional strategy had been, uh, vexation and exhaustion, which is simply the kind of terror attacks we saw, for example, in Mumbai, spectacular acts of terror, uh, the Charlie Hebdo attack, and to actually establish administrations of savagery, something that was made possible thanks to the US occupation of Iraq, uh, places like Camp Bucca, where you had the people who knew how to run a police, a police state, who worked for, under Saddam Hussein, who had de been debathified, joining up with figures like Abu Bakr Baghdadi, who eventually became ISIS's self-proclaimed caliph. And by establishing administrations of savagery, they would then begin breaking down these post-colonial, previously stable Arab states, like Syria and Libya. Uh, Chechnya and Afghanistan are named as partial successes uh, that were made possible, first of all, thanks to the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, but they failed to move from the administration of savagery into the Islamic State that this pseudonym, this, uh, this, this mysterious figure, Naji, uh, outlined. And so Syria would be essentially the test of that, where they would try to set up an Islamic State. But I liken this document to the documents that we saw tumbling out of neoconservative think tanks in 1996 at the height of unipolar American... Uh, triumphalism, when the U.S. had declared victory over the Soviet Union, when we thought, or our foreign policy elites thought they could do anything here. And so we saw a call for benevolent hegemony from Robert Kagan, who would go on to advise both Mitt Romney and Hillary Clinton, even hosting a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton, and Bill Kristol, who we just talked about. And you also had the clean break strategy put forward by two fig pro-Israel ideologues, Likudnik ideologues. Richard Pearl and Douglas Fife, who had worked out of the office, actually, of a Democrat, Scoop Jackson, in the 1970s. And this was their strategy, their regional strategy, that they offered Benjamin Netanyahu as he entered the prime minister's office for a first time. And if you look at that document, it looks very similar to 
the management of strategy. It's about fragmenting all of, this, all of the post-colonial Arab states that surround Israel and that are resisting its, its and the US's sphere of influence. And they actually call explicitly in that document for weaponizing Sunni Arab tribes in northeastern Syria against the government in Damascus. What, this is 1996. What happened later, uh, some almost two decades later, those Sunni Arab tribes were weaponized by the Islamic State and that they established their first caliphate in northeastern Syria, their administration of savagery in Raqqa through an invasion of Raqqa by Jabhat al-Nusra, which was the Al-Qaeda affiliate at the time acting as a Trojan horse for what would become the Islamic State and the Free Syrian Army, which was armed and trained by the CIA, the so-called moderate rebels. So they did it thanks to the weapons farm that the US set up. And that was, Obama was fully warned about that in a Defense Intelligence Agency document authored, not off, well, signed off on by one Michael Flynn, which warned of a Salafist principality being established imminently thanks to the US arm and equip program of the FSA and their allies in Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, something that came to bear in 2013. And of course, this war created the largest refugee crisis since the end of World War II, which in turn fueled the rise of far-right, xenophobic, and Islamophobic forces in Europe and the US and elsewhere. So we want to get to Syria and talk about how all these things are linked. And this is the point that Max makes again and again in his book. And he looks at several conflicts. And here we're going to kind of briefly go through some of those conflicts to see how it's the same tactic where the US national security state through the CIA, also through soft power groups like USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy, support the moderate rebels, right? The far right forces in countries they want to destabilize that they refer to as moderate beacons of democracy. And then those forces later, either when they come into power, uh, perpetuate these kinds of acts of terror that we see, or they come and blow back. And as we, can, we can talk about the war in Afghanistan, which is what we'll look at first. The classic case that gave birth to many of these forces we see today, the war in Afghanistan, which was one of the most important and one of the final wars of the Cold War, one of the most important proxy conflicts in the 1980s, gave birth to not just the far-right uh, Salafi forces we see, like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, but also to some of the same far-right political forces we have seen that are metastasizing through Europe, Europe. So, Max, you were talking about how we're living through a kind of new Cold War today. And um, it's not just me saying that. You can look at the new national security strategy drafted yeah. by the US D Defense Department that they released last year, two years ago now, that says that the new, the new goals that the US needs to overcome for national security, it's not undermining and fighting non-state terrorism. ISIS isn't even mentioned. Well, it's mentioned as the third most important priority. The most important priority now, according to the US national security official strategy, is countering what they call revisionist powers, which are China and Russia. That is, those are the words of former Defense Secretary Mattis. He said, great power competition is now our primary threat, not non-state and terror. And then the second, the second threat on this hierarchy of supposed threats would be countries like Iran, the DPRK, Syria, Venezuela. And then the third would be non-state actors. So we, we have re-entered a kind of new Cold War. We were talking about information war. We've seen Russiagate. And we, in order to understand how we got here and how the far right has come into power in multiple countries, we have to go back to the end of the first Cold War, yeah. and specifically the war in Afghanistan. So Max, explain why we need to understand the war in Afghanistan and why it's so important today. Yeah, the war in Afghanistan, the proxy war, is, is, is a model for so much of what we see today, down to the information war that we're victimized by. Uh, it was the product of a decision. I mean, I think it was inevitable um, because the U.S. had embarked on a very similar, under the, the Carter administration, had embarked on a very similar great power competition, and it decided to kind of weaken the second tier powers in order to bleed the first tier, the Soviet Union. Um, and Afghanistan was one of them. So 
Zbigniew Brzezinski, national security advisor to Carter, someone whose family comes from Galicia, which is now partly in Western Ukraine, which is a base of Ukrainian nationalism and part of a new US proxy war. Uh, also there, from the Polish nobility, and of course his daughter is a leading host on MSNBC. And you know, so he, his family were landowners. They were extreme anti-communists. He had a personal vested stake in taking down the Soviet Union by any means. And he talked about an arc of crisis in the third world where the Soviet Union was actually helping to stabilize certain states that had suffered from poverty and winning them as its own allies, and he sought to replace it in Afghanistan with what he called an arc of Islam, uh, which would actually prove to be very destabilizing. This meant funding people like Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, who was essentially an extremist warlord and a drug dealer who helped later flood the Soviet, the, later flood Russia with heroin. I interviewed uh, Vincent Canestraro, who was the former uh, CIA counterintelligence operative who knew Hekmatyar. He referred to him as Gulbud. He knew him so well. Yeah. He, brought, he helped bring him to Washington, where Hekmatyar actually refused to meet with Reagan. Um, but under Reagan's watch, the budget for the Afghan proxy war was doubled. It was the largest covert operation in CIA history. Uh, over a billion dollars, Operation Cyclone. And for some more context here, just, just so you know, so what happens is in Afghanistan, you have a revolution on the rise of a socialist yeah. government that is allied with the Soviet Union. And the strategy that Brzezinski later admitted was to try to lure the Soviet Union into Afghanistan by supporting these far-right Islamist groups in what he called the Afghan trap. That was Brzezinski's language in order to encourage what is now always referred to as the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan that was requested by the socialist government at the time of Afghanistan. It was an explicit trap that was meant to bleed the Soviet Union, as Max says, at its soft underbelly, if you look at where it is geopolitically. And the US allied with pleasant, great people like Hekmatyar, who was notorious for throwing acid in the face of women. This actually took place, the throwing of acid in the faces of women took place at Kabul University. Hekmatyar was one of the so-called professors, along with Burhanuddin Rabbani, uh, who were actually supported by the CIA back then in the early 70s through a front group called the Asia Foundation in order to weaken the student movement for uh, socialism in Afghanistan, which was sort of a nationalist movement at its core. And that uh, you know, eventually culminated with the arm and equip program that the CIA, in which the CIA gave over $600 million to this fanatic uh, and caused one of the first major refugee crises of the, of the, after the Cold War, uh, which Pakistani intelligence sort of benefited from. And, Pakistani intelligence was involved in this operation. The Saudis were involved in this operation with a matching fund and it helped consolidate the US special relationship with Saudi Arabia. And it also provided Saudi Arabia with a net benefit, which was that they were able to take, you know, you have the royal family, these guys who like to hang out on yachts, like uh, Mohammed bin Salman actually was caught drinking tequila with the rock. Um, and they are hated by the Wahhabi clergy and by a large slice of their population that's deeply pious and religious. So they were able to ventilate the internal crisis by sending young men over, the, uh, over to the Pakistani border to a place in Peshawar maintained and funded by a young Osama bin Laden, who was one of those young figures. It was called the Services Bureau. Bin Laden was working with a Palestinian named Abz Abdullah Azam to send foreign fighters onto the Afghan battlefield. It's important to keep in mind a Palestinian who left the Palestinian resistance movement because he didn't like it because it was too progressive too and secular. secular. And so, so then he moved to Saudi Arabia and engaged in these reactionary political forces and worked with the CIA. Essentially what takes place is, um, you know, by 1989, the Red Army is forced to leave. Uh, Mohammed Najibullah, who is their um, proxy, this sort of communist figure in Kabul remains and decides to fight it out with his own army um, against Ahmed Shah Massoud, Burhanuddin Rabbani, and Hekmatyar. He's eventually removed. And then you have a war of the warlords, a war of all against all, bristling with US weapons and half of Kabul is destroyed. The refugee crisis has worsened. The opium and heroin crisis across Europe is worsened. And all of Afghanistan is destabilized. This is the 1990s. Um, the U.S. Is, is looking to pay Hekmatyar still protection money to guard Unical's pipeline to the Caspian Sea. Uh, the relationship is still there. And then you have what 
Jack Bloom, who was the investigator for the Senate Select Committee under John Kerry um, of Iran-Contra, and this whole sad saga referred to me as the disposal problem, where figures like bin Laden come back to Saudi Arabia as a hero because this, you know, scion of wealth and aristocracy, he's seen in, a, you know, in caves with an army suit. He's seen as a badass and he comes back and he's a hero. And other figures are coming back, not just to their home countries, whether it's to the Philippines to form the Abu Sayyaf group or to Bosnia to fight in another US proxy war or to Chechnya, they're coming back to New York City. And here I'm talking about Omar Abdel Rahman, the blind sheikh, who was sent actually to the Afghan battlefield on a CIA flight and entered the US to New York on a CIA visa after Abdullah Azam, the Palestinian former head of the Services Bureau, was mysteriously killed in a car bomb because he was refusing to participate in the new strategy of this group, which was to kill Muslims who were takfir, who were not religiously, uh, religiously proper, to go after secular-oriented governments, like the government of Mubarak in Egypt, like the government of Assad in Syria. And Azam said, I won't kill other Muslims. He killed Sheikh um, Omar Abdel Rahman, the blind sheikh, takes over the Services Bureau's outfit in New York City, and the Services Bureau as a whole morphs into Al-Qaeda internationally. Al-Qaeda means the base, and it was named after the base that bin Laden, Azam, and Zawahiri had maintained in Afghanistan and they embark on their strategy of vexation. But meanwhile, you have this outfit in New York called the Al-Kifa Center, which is the Services Bureau's local office, operating under the watch of the FBI and the CIA. And it's guys who were trained in military-style tactics in Afghanistan and were being sent back to other battlefields to help the US, for example, destabilize Yugoslavia and Bosnia. Um, and they were also being taken to a gun range in Long Island by a triple agent named Ali Abdul Sud Mohammed, who was sent into New York by Zawahiri known and was simultaneously Ali. working for the CIA and FBI. Known as Ali the American. And so, you know, just before we get into him, I mean, you think about it, there actually was a, a de facto Al-Qaeda cell in New York City in the 1990s. It's sort of like an Islamophobe's wet dream. The thing is, it was operating under the watch of the CIA and still performing this service for the CIA while Al-Qaeda was being ignored in national security circles in the US. Um, I found one of the first references to Osama bin Laden in American media in the Washington Post, I think it was in 1995, and it was about how he was through the um, so-called golden chain and a series of charities like Benevolence International and another charity whose name I forget, sending money to the battlefield uh, in Bosnia and that the Clinton administration had instructed investigators to essentially lay off because their priority was to break down another stable uh, socialist-oriented state that resisted its fear of influence. Yeah, and, and related to that, many of you might have seen, there's a, an infamous now article by Robert Fisk, who's actually a, an amazing award-winning Middle East reporter, uh, that he infamously published in The Independent in 1993. It has a large photo of Osama bin Laden, and it's called Osama bin Laden, anti-Soviet warrior, puts his army on the road to peace. And it talks about how Osama bin Laden was working as a kind of loyal US proxy in Afghanistan to des destabilize the Soviet Union. So I think we're getting a little in the weeds here, but let's, let's look at the bigger picture. So it's important to understand the origins of these groups. Uh, like the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, in this war, this, cold, this war that was a proxy conflict in the larger Cold War, to fight against the Soviet Union, to fight against progressive socialist and communist forces. And also something that you stress in your book is that were it not for these conflicts, we would not be in the age we're in now of the war on terror, and we would not have had 9-11. In fact, I want to read a section from this book because it actually is a good segue to understand what brought us to the hellish state we're in in the world. Uh, over now, you know, almost two decades into the war on terror, and you have a section in the beginning and you write, this book makes the case that Trump's election would not have been possible without 
and the subsequent military interventions conceived by the national security state that have fueled these far-right forces. And you say, further, I argue that if the CIA had not spent over a billion dollars arming Islamist militants in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union during the height of the Cold War, empowering jihadi godfathers like al Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden in the process, the 9-11 attacks would have almost certainly not taken place. And if the Twin Towers were still standing today, it is not hard to imagine an alternative political universe in which a demagogue like Trump was still relegated to real estate and reality TV. So this brings us, so we have understood that throughout this war, in the Reagan, beginning in the Carter years and in the Reagan years, when the US was arming Contras and far-right death squads in Nicaragua, it was arming the equivalent in Afghanistan. You talk rather comically of this, this program that the US had called Adopta Muj, Adopta Mujahid. Uh, and it was where these Republicans, these white Republicans were just like, yeah, I adopted a Mujahid fighter, which, which is the Arabic word for jihadist, a jihadist fighter from Afghanistan who were fighting well, against it's, the Soviet it Union. It essentially means a freedom fighter and not necessarily uh, well, the, the way we popularly the understand it. Translation. But this was yes. my source on that story is sitting in the front row, um, <laughs> Helena Cobbin. Uh, you went to this conference uh, in, I mean, you could talk about it now real briefly, but you went to this conference in Tucson, uh, keynoted by a young, hard-charging freshman congressman named John McCain, and oh, 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 um, Republican women were, adopt, in their words, adopting a mouge. Yeah, you got it. Um, I mean, these kind of very elderly, rich women with too many facelifts, you know, and <laughs> like wanting to feel, you know, that they have the attention of some young virile or whatever. And, you know, they were standing there with their muj, wearing sort of, you know, a muj outfit, which involves that fun, funny floppy hat. And, and it was quite the thing on the, uh, on the Tucson, Arizona um, social circuit at the time. And infamously, Rambo 3, you can find this online. The film is just a propaganda film for the Afghan Mujahideen. And at the end of the movie, it says, this film is dedicated to the brave, heroic fighters of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Of course, these are the ancestors that gave birth, as he mentioned, to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And as Max documents in his book, when the Taliban took over Kabul and, and consolidated control over Afghanistan, there was a press briefing in which the State Department welcomed it, and their response was, well, uh, we think that they'll construct a state s similar to Saudi Arabia. You know, it's not going to be that bad, and for our interests, it's fine. So that brings us, of course, to 9-11, because yeah, these we, are the we'll groups We'll get that, the, actually, that the actual blowback. quote by the State Department official was, I think, to Ahmed Rashid, the reporter, and he said, we'll get... Uh, Aramco, we'll get an Aramco-like pipeline and Sharia law, and we can live with that. Um, another special relationship, the U.S. actually did support in, initially the Taliban because they provided some modicum of stability when the warlords that the CIA had backed had torn everything apart. And there were many average Afghans who actually supported it as well because they were sick of living in a war of all against all. But building up to 9-11, I mean, what Ben illustrated was the kind of culture of the Cold War, um, which we're, re we're living again, where these kind of events were seen as commonplace and normal. And these were freedom fighters, in fact. I mean, I learned it from John Rambo. I learned it from Dan Rather, Gunga Dan, according to the Washington Post critic Tom Shales. Gung Dan Rather went and hung out with the Mujahideen and said they don't have enough bullets. They have Enfield rifles. They're fighting for freedom. Um, you know what they wound up getting ultimately was quite the opposite. But it was really in the 90s when I think the national security elite in the US started to realize they had a problem on their hands. Uh, it was the Tanzania, and Ken the, the Tanzania and Kenya bombings carried out by Al Qaeda against US consulates. And who did the advance, uh, who is sort of the advance man for those bombings, who took the pictures of the locations? Whose pet project was it? It was a person I named earlier, Ali Abdel Sud Mohammed, Ali the American who was operating under the protection of the FBI and CIA, who had actually trained and uh, lived at Fort Bragg and was part of the JFK School of Special Warfare, operating under the watch of a colonel named Norval Diatkin, who wrote the intro to a very racist Orientalist book called The Arab Mind, which was later used um, to devise torture tactics against Iraqis and Afghans at Abu Ghraib. 
and uh, Bagram Air Base. And Ali Abdul Sud Mohammed, Ali the American, was giving seminars for army officers about the Arab mind overseen by Norval Diatkin while he was going over to Afghanistan to train with bin Laden's forces at Khost. I actually have here a series of what were then classified documents, these are photocopied, um, that were spirited out of the, for the JFK School of Special Warfare by Ali Muhammad, who was operating under the protection of our national security state. And he basically annotates them in Arabic. Um, you can see here he's annotating basically how to use an M72 light anti-tank weapon, which is made in the hometown of my friend Dan Cohen back there. Um, you know, you can kind of see it. I'll hold it up. Um, and, you know, this was so Al-Qaeda could use them. Where were they found? They were found in the home of El Sayyid Nasser, who is the assassin of the extremist rabbi Meyer Kahana, who was part of the Al-Kifa Center that I talked about before, basically the local office of Al-Qaeda operating under the watch of the CIA. So I interviewed, you know, Nasser was put on trial for that killing. And I interviewed the lawyers who defended Nasser and many of his colleagues, some of whom were mentally disturbed, um, who were not fit to stand trial. And this was the US attempting to end its disposal problem with this contrived case against them and the blind sheikh to basically put to bed what they had created in Afghanistan in mid-90s New York. And one of the lawyers I interviewed, Roger Stavis, he was a, such a brilliant defense lawyer. He referred to these characters as Team America. And he said, <laughs> how can you put them on trial? They were loyal soldiers for America's interests. And it's all about Afghanistan, 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 Afghanistan. He learned through this trial about Ali Muhammad. And he sought to call him to testify. And that wasn't going to work with the right-wing lawyer who was a prosecutor, Andrew McCarthy, or Patrick Fitzgerald, who would eventually become the head of Alex Station, the I-49 group that was dedicated to fighting Al-Qaeda. Fitzgerald and McCarthy advised and actually ordered Ali Muhammad to not come back to the trial and to ignore his subpoena because it was so embarrassing for the CIA because he was still active. The blind sheikh, Omar Abdel Rahman, was also put on trial. It was a contrived plot that, he, that was sort of manufactured by an informant, a confidential informant. Um, and I learned from his, one of his defense lawyers, Abdin Jabara, that the CIA was initially worried about him being put on trial and they had actually postponed his prosecution in order to prevent uh, an embarrassment. He was eventually put on trial. Uh, an FBI agent who mentioned the fact that he had been trained in Afghanistan was subsequently reassigned right after the trial. So there was this embarrassment. The whole thing was swept under the rug. To make a long story short, short uh, Ali Muhammad was eventually put in uh, witness protection center in a federal prison. He was never allowed to really take the stand. He was registered as John Doe in the federal prison system by 1998. And he reappeared in a very interesting moment that many of you who saw Fahrenheit 9-11 might be familiar with, but you won't be familiar with him as the source of this moment. When George W. Bush was presented with the presidential daily briefing at Crawford, Texas, I think it was on August 15th. Remember when the systems were blinking red and he received a very long PDB. It was a page and a half long. And it said, Bin Laden determined to strike inside the US. And if you re actually read that document, I hadn't read it until I started doing this book. The source was a former Egyptian Islamic Jihad cadre referring to Ali Muhammad. And everybody he talked about was, it was so obvious he was describing everything he knew from his time as Al Qaeda's man in the US. Um, but that whole scandal remained swept under the rug. Not one journalist pointed to him except for Peter Lance, whose work I tried to revive in my book. So you have Bush, basically, he looks at it for like five minutes, throws it in the trash can, and they move on. America was in a unusual cultural moment, and I describe that moment in a chapter called Summer of the Shark where the mainstream media, the corporate media, didn't have anything to scare people with. And so they were losing ratings, which is another factor in Russiagate. And so they came up with the Sharknado, 
of body parts bobbing in the sea, when in fact shark attacks were down from the previous year. And I quote one oceanologist who said that um, he was receiving over 50 calls a day from reporters looking to, for news about shark attacks. And then you also had Chandra Levy, which is a local DC story, and Gary Condit dominated the news that summer while the systems were blinking red. Now let me just talk about one other thing that was happening that will illustrate how cynical the national security state has been around 9-11. Two figures who had been to basically, you know, uh, you know the, the super meeting of Al-Qaeda in Malaysia, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid, Mid, Khalid al-Midhar had arrived in Los Angeles. Um, these were hardcore al-Qaeda trainees who had actually been made Bosnian citizens thanks to their participation in that proxy war. Uh, they were products of the Wahhabi school system in Saudi Arabia, and they, were, they had their passports taken and photographed by CIA agents at this summit in Malaysia because they were known. And they flew together into the United States, into LAX, landed, were picked up by a ghost employee of the Saudi Aviation Authority named Omar Bayoumi, who is in fact a Saudi intelligence agent who with his own money rented them an apartment in the suburbs of, I believe, San Diego. Uh, they were taken to a Saudi, the Saudi funded King Fahad Mosque to meet community members and shepherded around while they took flight lessons. And neighbors described black cars pulling up to their house for 10 minutes at a time, fancy cars. This, the FBI was not told about these characters' presence by the CIA at the Malaysian summit. And um, Lawrence Wright, who wrote about this in The Looming Tower, speculated that it may have been because the CIA was seeking to recruit them the same way it had done with Ali Muhammad, which it had lost. We don't know. But these two figures became the two key muscle hijackers on, I believe, American Airlines Flight 93. I think it was the second plane that hit the World Trade Center. And they were not put on a terrorist watch list until after Bush saw the presidential daily briefing. We still have to ask why the CIA did not tell Alex Station and the FBI about that. And of course, the head of Alex Station, John O'Neill, was killed in one of those World Trade Center attacks. And then 9-11 obviously changes everything. So, you know, going, getting into Trump, let me just get into Trump here, because we want to bring it home. I mean, this book is all about bringing it home. It's about us. Donald Trump at the time was kind of failing. He wasn't getting, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't building. He wasn't winning. Um, he owed a lot of money. Um, to a lot of contractors. He had got in over his head in the city and his celebrity was on the wane. And one of the shows that Donald Trump was able to remain relevant on was Howard Stern's show. Howard Stern was the top shock jock in the country, number one drive time show. And 9-11 took place while Howard Stern's show was on air. And I, I basically transcribed Howard Stern's show from 9-11 in a subsequent chapter after the Summer of the Shark. It's called Pam Anderson's Jet because Howard Stern's talking about going on a date with Pamela Anderson at this seedy bar called Scores and bragging about how he felt her butt. And then the first plane hits and he says, oh, that's a big fire. Anyway, back to me and Pam Anderson. I was too tired to take her home. And then the second jet hits and he says, uh, it's probably Pam Anderson's jet. And then the word comes in that it was a terrorist attack. And then him and his sidekick, Robin Quivers, start calling for a war of extermination, a genocidal war. They called for chemical attacks. Burn their eyes out, Robin Quiver said. She even said, why are they attacking us? We stopped colonialism. She actually said that. And this is the show that people across New York, you know, the people on the Long Island Railroad on their Walkmans were listening to. This is what people were listening to at work. And there's no question that Donald Trump, when he appeared on Howard Stern a few days later, he knew, he, he had his ear close to the ground. He understood the power of that exterminationist, Islamophobic rhetoric. And then the rest of America got treated to Gunga Dan, who had gone to hype up the Mujahideen a week later on Dave Letterman. He looked like he hadn't slept in days. He was shell-shocked. And he had obviously been briefed by someone in the Bush administration. If you watch his appearance, he had his talking points down. And his role was to prepare the American public for a war, a permanent war, an endless war. And he said, there will be many casualties. 
Many will die, but we have to fa face this fight because this is the fight of our generation. And then he proceeds to spread a racist rumor that Arab Americans were celebrating from across the Hudson on their rooftops. And of course, many of us know the only people seen celebrating that day were a mysterious group of Israelis, according to ABC and the Jewish Daily Forward. Um, that lie was repeated by Donald Trump in his 2015 campaign. The rhetoric of Howard Stern emanated from Trump's mouth in his successful presidential campaign. The whole culture of 9-11 and the legal basis for permanent war through the AM, AUMF, which Congress refuses to sunset, it all comes from 9-11. And without that culture, that we, there's no way that we could conceive of someone like Donald Trump rising through the ranks to become president. I think there's so many other factors, but I wrote about one factor in Trump's rise. And I point the finger not at you know, the people that Trump demonizes, immigrants, Muslims. I'm pointing the finger at the people in air-conditioned offices here in Washington, D.C., who've profited from Donald Trump's presidency and from his national security great competition plan and who've profited from these proxy wars, the managers of savagery. And in his book, Max kind of details the various responses to 9-11. So you have the national security state declares the perpetual war on terror, using that to justify all of these plans that they had drafted. Wesley Clark, who was a previous general who also commanded NATO, famously revealed that the Bush administration had drafted a list of seven countries in five years to go after. And this gave them the the uh, ability to do so. And then there was also the Islamophobes who said, this is all just because of Islam, it's because Muslims are inherently violent. And then there is, of course, the other crowd, which you go after in your book, which is the truther crowd. And I actually want to read a very clever part of this book, because Max is, is problematizing all of these views, obviously the national security state, obviously the Islamophobes, and also the truthers, and pointing out that that actually, this simplistic understanding undermines the actual, the actual crisis that we're facing and the actual problems. And you write, for many of the disillusioned youth that gravitated into 9-11 truth circles, these critical pieces of historical and political context seemed overly complex and utterly unsatisfying. And then the movies like Loose Change, this famous truth or documentary, avoided any exploration of the blowback from American empire, from the policies of the war in Afghanistan, from what the CIA has been doing. And instead, it hones in on granular details of the explosions. And then you talk about the rise of a specific kind of far right movement, which we can't understand Donald Trump without, specifically Alex Jones. And you have a very funny part here. You talk about. Alex Jones proved eager to channel anti-establishment energy into right-wing mobilization. Having put 9-11 truth on the national radar, Jones, Alex Jones from InfoWars, opened up a new front against undocumented immigrants, joining forces with the white nationalist border vigilantes known as the Minutemen to paint illegal immigration as a globalist plan to destroy American culture. So again, we see how the national security state, the CIA, US imperialism have given birth to these far right forces, not only internationally, but domestically. And you point out that thanks to Alex Jones, people who question US involvement with groups like Al Qaeda, anything related to that, they could be dismissed as cranks because of the 9-11 truth movement. Anyone who talks about US support for Al Qaeda, well, you conspiracy can, theorists, exactly. the word is used as a weapon to basically drive people like us to the margins. And then you add, if Jones had not, ex this is a joke, but it's, it's a point. If Jones had not, ex Alex Jones, if he had not existed, the establishment might have had to create him. Or perhaps, if one wants to get conspiratorial, it did. For Americans struggling to make sense of 9-11, there was also an explanation that was far more accessible than this so-called inside job conspiracy, and which did not threaten to undercut their sense of American exceptionalism, this theory held the Islamic faith of the attackers responsible and cast suspicion on Muslims living across the United States. So this gets us to the, the era that I could think you could say ended in 2017 with the election of Trump, which is the war on terror, where the Republican and Democratic parties unite and say, we have to fight these permanent wars abroad to defend our people here at home from this boogeyman terrorism that can never truly be defeated.
And of course, you're not allowed to talk about the fact that these are some of the same forces that the US had supported, just as a similar blowback problem we've seen in Latin America with Contra death squads in Colombia and Mexico that became drug dealers, right? Became the narcos that control large swaths of Mexico that had been CIA assets. Or of course, we can look at other areas. So let's, let's bring us in leading up more toward the war in Syria and Libya and today and explaining how the war on terror and Islamophobia, and of course, Israel plays a role in this, helped create, give birth to the kind of warrior Republicans, the Breitbart right, and the Islamic phobic right. Yeah, I'll try to tie it into Alex Jones. I mean, it's a lot to chew on, but my book opens not just with the Af Afghan proxy war, but it's, it basically opens in 1979, two years after I was born. Um, you know, not, I think like what, Paul, when were you born? 81, 81, right? Two years before my brother was born. I mean, this is the, the culture that we grew up in, really, I think the political culture began in 1979 and it was, also the, so that was also the year that Netanyahu, a young Benjamin Netanyahu, began hosting a series of conferences for major national security mandarins and journalists under the auspices of the Jonathan Institute, which was named after his brother who was killed in the Entebbe raid, uh, Yonatan Netanyahu, uh, to educate them about the concept of terrorism. This was a word that wasn't really widely used in, uh, in the US, even in national security circles, it wasn't understood the way it was. Now, and what Netanyahu emphasized what this is, is that this is a distinctly Arab phenomenon, and it's about the Arabs against the Judeo-Christian West. We believe in freedom, they believe in what? Some, well, they were, you know, the PLO was a secular group at the time, but he was lumping them all together along with Islamist groups. And While Israel was supporting terrible. Hamas, this is, it's the same strategy. While Israel was supporting Hamas and Islamist groups to undermine the communist progressive forces, he was spreading this, this idea that, oh, well, it's the Arab mind and terrorism is a clash of civilization. And, and, and it was always an elite narrative. You know, regular people weren't really buying into it. I remember hearing about it in the 80s when I was in third grade. We had to do like a military parade in my school because my teacher had a son in the Navy and she was real into the military. We simulated taking down a terrorist, a hijacker. And we weren't really into it. It didn't really reach the public till 9-11. Um, but you had a figure in Washington, Stephen Emerson, who produced a film that was kind of his loose change. It was his vehicle for his narrative, and it was called The Terrorist Next Door. And it did the same thing that Loose Change did, which is take the, um, the concept of what would happen on 9-11, this is right before, and deprive it of all context uh, and basically make it out to be terror is being spread by people who believe in Islam, who are infesting our universities, they're living next door to us, and they're forming terror cells. And he was able to point to the terror cell or the you know, extremist cell at the al Kifa Center because the CIA had nurtured it. And that was his basically Exhibit A. So after 9-11, Emerson and his friends in the FBI and his friends in the Justice Department basically went after Palestinian professors and Muslims running groups like the Holy Land Foundation, which had nothing to do with international terrorism. And these were the terror busts and dragnets that John Ashcroft needed to justify the war on terror to the American public. They needed some guy with a beard and a and dark skin to come on TV and be uh, frog marched in handcuffs into a federal court just to say they were taking down these terror networks, which had been taken down long ago once the CIA decided to clean up its disposal problem. Um, so you have Emerson there, then you have Alex Jones who was speaking an anti-elitist narrative that fell on very fertile soil among a kind of new movement that was emerging that was neither Democrat nor Republican, uh, that adopted an alternative aesthetic um, that was sort of tended to be right wing but questioned uh, the establishment. And he talked about the globalists. He was famous mainly because he had been a prime time talker on the radio and he was the only one on the radio who spoke to the doubts that the American public had about the official story of 9-11. But as you said, he exploited them and took them in the wrong direction. Uh, and he, I mean, he obviously, if you've ever seen our Alex Jones, he's super charismatic. Like, I love watching him talk just for the sheer amusement of it. Um, well, and when he was sued by his ex-wife, his lawyer actually admitted that, oh, he's not a journalist, he's a performance artist. 
in, in any case, I mean, it's part of the whole shtick. You know, some journalists are performance artists too. Uh, in any Don't case, pretend to be journalists. You know, just 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 you know, moving forward to Trump again. I mean, Alex Jones was a major force in the election of Donald Trump, and Donald Trump actually responded to. Uh, letters sent to him by truth or organizations and said, thank you for your support. Donald Trump sent Roger Stone onto uh, Alex Jones's show every week uh, to mobilize the people in the street who were, you know, Trump's kind of silent majority, his hidden base. And, well, and explain the emergence of Breitbart as well. It's a key part of this. And so, yeah, I mean, we also need to understand where Steve Bannon came from. You know, Steve Bannon, remember, he was the boogeyman, and every member of Congress had to sign a resolution condemning him after Trump was elected. And, you know, he was basically going to put us all in camps or something. Uh, he was gone before we knew it because he had no friends in Washington. Um, where did Steve Bannon come from? Steve Bannon comes from the, you know, Islamophobe. Islamophobia industry that emerged thanks to figures like Steve Emerson, thanks to the David Horowitz Freedom Center, uh, which, you know, and I was going to point out, Alex Jones was also supported by billionaires. Um, Mark Cuban, I think, helped fund um, his film, Lose Change. Um, he, or he, I believe he discussed funding it. I'm he, just, he discussed getting it shown on Virgin Flight. Okay, so billionaires liked him. In any case, David Horowitz was taking money from billionaires like Robert Shillman, who's a big funder of uh, University of Northeastern University and a major funder of the pro-Israel lobby, and basically funding the voices of the Islamophobia movement right after the war in Iraq had ended. And I think that's such a seminal point in history, uh, in the history of my book, is 2007. George W. Bush was discredited within the conservative movement. Uh, he was seen as too moderate. His approval rating was like in the 20s, uh, young men were coming back from Iraq with no legs, no arms, and the Justice Department had also embarked on a program to recruit Iraq War veterans into the ranks of the police, which contributed directly to police militarization, and the Pentagon had implemented a program called 1044 to take the surplus arms that were used in Iraq uh, and put them in the hands of local police officials, including rural police, including the University of California Berkeley's police. They, they had like an armored vehicle that was, given, that was used in Iraq. So police are being militarized. People are coming back from Iraq angry. You have a new breed of Republican politician like Ilario Pantano, who ran for Congress in North Carolina, and his claim to fame was he, he was put on trial for emptying, emptying two clips into two Iraqi captives that his unit had taken, filling them with scores of bullets, and then leaving a note on their corpses that read, no better friend, no worse enemy, which was a quote by his hero, General James Mattis. You had figures like Chris Kyle, the American sniper, who claimed to have I don't, killed I don't know how many people in Iraq, in Fallujah, as the greatest sniper, uh, who also claimed to have shot looters on, from the roof of the Superdome during Hurricane Katrina, emerging as this right-wing folk hero. You had Marcus Luttrell, the ultimate warrior, who spoke at the Republican convention in Cleveland in 2016, who basically concocted a story of fighting off a horde of Taliban. He was actually saved by a Muslim man, Marcus Gulab, uh, sorry, Mohammed Gulab, who he um, later kicked to the curb. You had Alan West in Florida, another Iraq War veteran who was made a hero because he was put on trial for pistol whipping an Iraqi man at a, at a intersection and holding a gun to his head and firing a gun behind his head to extract information. All of these people became right-wing heroes because of the atrocities they meted out in George W. Bush's failed war, and now the war had come home. And as the war came home, many of them, I think almost all of the figures I just named, appeared as speakers at the Park 51 mosque during the culmination of the Islamophobia industry, uh, a protest against the construction of a mosque at its holiest site, the World Trade Center. Uh, I think it was in 2010. Who funded that event? And who funded the ads that drummed up support for that event, full page ads in the New York Times? Robert Mercer, who became the key funder of Donald Trump's political campaign in 2016, and who funded the political fortunes, supported the political fortunes of everyone from Steve Bannon to Kellyanne Conway, directly overseen by his daughter, Rebecca Mercer, actually Thomas Hedges, who's here, has a great documentary about this network. But it all starts there. 
with this pro with this in this Islamophobia industry. Stephen Miller, how did he get started? At Duke University, Stephen Miller and a close friend of his named Richard Spencer. Richard Spencer, who is the face and voice of neo-Nazism in America, ran the Duke Conservative Union together, and they hosted a series of events that David Horowitz helped set up called Islamofascism Awareness Week. It was all about 9-11. It was all about Afghanistan. It was all about the failure in Iraq. And it was all about Islamophobia. And this was something that Trump came to understand by adopting these figures on his pirate ship. Um, one final mention uh, goes to Andrew Breitbart, um, who you uh, mentioned. You know, Breitbart went with, I think, Steve Bannon and a guy named Larry Solov, who is a hedge funder or something, to meet Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem in 2007. And they came out of that meeting with the idea to start the publication Breitbart that was taken over by Steve Bannon after Andrew Breitbart reached his tweet limit. Um, and so if it weren't for these moments and the role of Israel and all of Israel's present in all of it, I really don't think Trump would have found his voice in 2016 calling for a Muslim ban on an unedited, unexpurgated live press conference shown by CNN across America as his former, uh, as the former producer of The Apprentice who had become the CEO of CNN sought to advance Trump's fortunes to build ratings. So we have to go back to that period after Iraq, and that's what I do in my book. And meanwhile, the Middle East is changing because of Iraq. And this leads us to the final two subjects, which we'll get to. Uh, we'll talk, about, of course, about Syria and the war in Libya and the war in Syria, and then conclude kind of reflecting on the moment we're in. Because, you know, as I've said several times here, the point that Max repeatedly makes throughout his book, looking at different case studies, is how these same far-right forces, both externally and also domestically, that the US national security state has supported at various moments for its own imperialist interests have come to blow back to attack us, to attack people collectively here in the US and in other countries. And that has in turn continued to fuel the xenophobic racist far right. We've seen that again and again and again. And of course this leads us to the, to the war in Libya where some of the same figures you saw who were a part of the Islamophobia industry when it was politically expedient in blaming Islam and blaming Muslims collectively, suddenly they became some of the biggest cheerleaders for the CIA-backed militants overthrowing secular governments in Libya and subsequently Syria. So you had this very interesting moment where these neoconservatives from groups like the FDD and others, other think tanks here in Washington who had pushed these Islamophobic narratives suddenly are now cheerleading for Al-Qaeda allied groups. Of course, NATO is playing a leading role in all of this. And we'll start with Libya here. Libya is a case, it's the case study for us to understand what Max is talking about in his book with blowback. Because specifically, you, you probably heard of the Manchester bombing where dozens of people were killed. Teenagers what, mostly. At a, an Ariana Grande concert. What of course corporate media outlets virtually never acknowledged is that the, the killer, Salman Abadi, who blew himself up, had been fighting with support from British intelligence, MI6, and the US in Libya with his father, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. And then he went to Syria several times and was going back and forth to Libya and Syria with the support of British intelligence. And then, of course, came and blew himself up and killed dozens of people in the UK. So that, help us ex that helps us to explain what Mac hit Max hits again and again and again in his book, is how these same forces have come back to bite us. And maybe we can talk a bit about Libya and then briefly about Syria. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say. And of course, Libya is back in the news because eight years later, it's still destabilized, as I think the West would like it to be. Um, of course, Libya was one of the seven countries on the list drafted by the Bush administration, seven countries in five years. They didn't do it in five years, but they've managed to destabilize and destroy the states in most of those countries in 15 or so and years. And they were all countries that challenged Israel. Strange coincidence. Well, and simply challenged U.S. imperialism, Israel being an extension of U.S. power in the region. So, you know, I write about how Muammar Gaddafi was the first uh, world leader or official to report Osama bin Laden to Interpol. And he was essentially laughed at uh, by the West. Uh, it was basically ignored. Uh, and the MI6 was busy setting up the uh, Libyan Islamic fighting group Ratline of uh, figures like Abdel Hakim Belhaj, uh, 
uh, who had fought in Afghanistan and now was seeking to assassinate Gaddafi, something that the UK, which has heavily invested in Libya, and the French were happy to see happen. Um, you know, Gaddafi made a, a terrible mistake as he sought to get out from the West's destabilization attempts, which was to give up his deterrent capacity. He gave up his supposed nuclear program, which was not really a nuclear weapons program. And then he proceeded to give up his biological and chemical weapons stocks to the extent that he had them. And this is a lesson that's been absorbed by figures like North Korea's Kim in maintaining and actually growing a nuclear arsenal in order to force the US to the negotiating table. Because if you don't do that, you wind up getting sodomized with a bayonet as Gaddafi was. And as Marco Rubio on Twitter recently threatened President Nicolas Maduro with the same fate, posting a photo of video, a frame of Gaddafi being sodomized with a bayonet by NATO-backed Salafi jihadi forces. So, so Libya was basically a case study in the R2P doctrine, which is advanced by Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is director of policy planning under Hillary Clinton. Responsibility to protect, sorry, thanks. Um, Samantha Power is a big advocate of this. Uh, you know, these are the ideologues who are operating in the State Department and the Obama administration who are pushing to do what was done in Serbia or in Yugoslavia, it, which is bizarrely seen in Washington as this great success uh, in Libya. And they succeeded amid the fervor of the Arab Spring. And I admit that the, you know, the Arab Spring kind of had me in a state where I couldn't sort one thing out from the other. The, uh, there, were, there were not you know, reformist protests against Gaddafi. Uh, they were not purely peaceful. They were violent. And there were also massive protests in support of Gaddafi. By, there were some protests that had hundreds of thousands of people in Benghazi uh, and in CERT, where they were saying, we do not want you to topple this government and bomb us because we know what comes next. And Gaddafi knew what came next. He actually phoned Tony Blair, who had negotiated that deal to end his deterrent capacity and bring Gaddafi back into the West, into the, in normalize relations with him. And he said that if you topple me, this government will be overwhelmed by Wahhabi elements who do not, he said that they do not speak Arabic, they speak in Islamic language. Uh, those are Gaddafi's words. And he said, you will face an unprecedented refugee crisis and Lampedusa, this um, Italian island that had become a way station for refugees would be resemble Somalia. That was Gaddafi's words. They're not my words. And he was also he was definitely appealing to racist sentiment in Europe. They proceeded to attack Gaddafi, and in the West here we were told that Gaddafi's army was going to march on Benghazi and kill everybody. Um, that we had, they had, the bombing had to begin through, from NATO to save the people of Benghazi from a massive massacre. And in fact, as Alan Cooperman at Harvard's Belfer Center had demonstrated, by that point, less than 1,000 people had died. Gaddafi had recaptured every town, and the opposition had essentially folded. So they were basically trying to save the opposition. And who was the opposition? It wasn't the National Transitional Council that Bernard Henri Lévy had sold Hillary on. It was the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group that emerged from the Afghanistan battlefield and was an ally of Al-Qaeda. And so NATO comes in, bombs, there's massacres, there are massacres on the ground. People are, uh, Gaddafi, as he's leaving Sirte, uh, there are, there's a massacre at a nearby hotel of his supporters. There are massacres of the Tawarga, who are black Libyans, who are seen as pro-Qaddafi uh, by, the, by these um, extremist elements. They were massacred. Uh, the country is destabilized. Gaddafi is killed with his caravan thanks to a NATO airstrike. Which it wasn't uh, thanks Probably to, Canadian. you know, the way we saw that play out in the U.S., the way we saw those images was Gaddafi's people hate him so much they're just ripping him to shreds. And in fact, what was taking place was that he was trying to escape a bombing with his inner circle. And um, first a drone piloted by a you know, joystick jockey from Nellis Air Base in Nevada hits his hits his caravan, then two French jets hit it. Then they're set upon by Libyan Islamic fighting group uh, mercenaries who are supported by the US and Qatar. They kill Gaddafi's bodyguards, behead them because they were black, and then they sodomize Gaddafi with a bayonet and torture him and kill him and leave his body to rot 
on a mattress in Misrata for opposition uh, supporters to take victory trophies with. And what proceeds to happen in Sirt, two years later, it's under the control of the Islamic State. It's under the control of ISIS. Benghazi, Tripoli, is under the control of Abdel Hakim Belhaj, who John McCain had basically gone to Libya to celebrate and declare he is not Al Qaeda. And the country split, plunged into a civil war, which it's still fighting. The refugee crisis that Europe faced has transformed European politics and brought figures like Matteo Salvini to power in Italy with the Liga movement, the Five Stars movement. Um, you know, everything that Gaddafi warned Tony Blair about has come to bear. So Libya is a case study in the failure of the R2P doctrine. It's a case study in liberal interventionists attempting to export human rights and democracy and getting the exact opposite because the people who suffer most when liberal interventionists get what they want are women and religious minorities and the most vulnerable. And I write about a militia called the Nawasi Battalion actually kidnapping gay men across Tripoli. The Nawasi Battalion is part now of the UN recognized government that uh, Khalifa Haftar is seeking to remove from Tripoli in order to unify Libya. Yeah, and we don't have time to get into that, but Khalifa Haftar uh, actually lived for 20 years quite near here, several miles away in suburban Virginia. He was a longtime CIA asset who had been leading uh, forces to try to overthrow Gaddafi. He was actually, uh, he was airlifted out of Libya by the CIA along with some of his fighters after a failed raid to kill Gaddafi and he lived for 20 years in suburban Virginia and then of course when NATO overthrew the Libyan state and turned it into a country now that has no central government and has rampant slave markets, open air slave markets where sub-Saharan African refugees are sold for a few, a few US dollars. Yeah, it's just uh, a fact that Barack Obama helped bring slavery back to Africa. And Hillary Clinton who played a leading role. And then that finally that leads us to Syria, which is the topic that is not mentioned until the end of Max's book. It's only a, a part of his book, but it is also the topic that uh, book burners have tried to get this event canceled for, uh, for revealing the degree to which, again, we see the echo of these far-right external forces that the CIA and U.S. national security state have supported have come back and bit not just us, but people throughout the world. And of course, uh, we, we could talk about Syria for hours and we won't, we'll conclude pretty soon, but let, let's just talk about what happened in Syria briefly. It's very similar to Libya where you do have some protests which are organic and legitimate, but then you also have far-right violent elements that are trying to exploit these protests to lead a stable, destabilization campaign to incite a civil war and to overthrow the state, which is exactly what we saw in Syria. There were, there were protests and then there were also far-right Islamist elements that were working with Turkey, Jordan, the CIA, we now know Israel, Saudi Arabia, and actually I think it's very fitting that the book concludes with Syria and Trump because Syria is one of the most eerie echoes of Afghanistan in the 80s where again you see the US is, the CIA is arming a far-right Salafi Jihadi force in alliance with Saudi Arabia, we're just as with Operation Cyclone in Afghanistan. Saudi Arabia agreed to match every dollar by the CIA. In Syria, Saudi Arabia also agreed to help fund the program Operation Timber Sycamore. The same person, Prince Bandar bin Salman, who helped the straw, uh, helped uh, arrange for the weapons uh, to be sold through his old straw buyers from Central America and Afghanistan. So again, we see how we'll talk about this, but again, the, the point. You know, instead of just getting in the weeds and the details, the point is that in the post-Cold War era, where there is no other threat to challenge this U.S. hegemon, it feels free to just overthrow governments throughout the world that are insufficiently beholden to U.S. interests, economic, political interests, and these independent secular states in the region that refuse to normalize and recognize Saudi Arabia and Israel, that refuse to ally with Saudi Arabia and Israel, are targeted for destabilization and overthrow, and Syria is the latest example. Yeah, I believe that the arm and equip program, which, uh, in which the CIA contributed one out of every $13 in its budget to arm the so-called Free Syrian Army, and basically created a weapons farm, for Al-Qaeda's largest affiliate since 9-11 to grow 
and for the Islamic State to develop is one of the greatest scandals of our time. And that's why it has to be, any discussion of it has to be so ferociously suppressed because so many of the people who lobbied for this and who participated in it in an intimate fashion appear on the pages of my book. And those actual people, Moaz Mustafa, Charles Lister, the Syrian American Council, James Lemercerier, the founder of the White Helmets who founded this influence operation out of Turkey, a former British military intelligence officer. Well, former, you're never really a former. They appear on the pages of my book in very unflattering fashion. So it's understandable that they would want this book to be disappeared. But I mean, I, it, there's so much to say about Syria that I don't know uh, almost where to start, except that this began in Libya. And I want to make a quick point about our politics. Um, the Benghazi investigation was essentially what I consider to be two things. One, it was a mechanism for destroying Hillary Clinton, who before Benghazi was, I think, the most popular person in the Obama administration had the highest approval rating. And if you track her approval rating, her public approval rating and public trust, it starts to decline immediately as the Benghazi investigation goes down. In fact, Representative Kevin McCarthy admitted that Benghazi was basically designed to erode public trust in Hillary Clinton because they knew she was running for president. Number two, I believe Benghazi was enacted as a substitute for a real interrogation of what happened in Libya because everyone down to Trey Gowdy, voted for that despicable war. Everybody, and only 13 members of parliament in the UK voted against it, and I bet you all can name one of them who's under ferocious attack right now by that country's national security state. Corbyn, so this was a way of kind of avoiding what was, real, what, what was really taking place in Benghazi. What was really taking place in Benghazi? Why was Christopher Stevens there? Why was he at the Benghazi consulate? Why did he put himself in danger? He was there to manage the rat line to Syria because Gaddafi's arms were being taken out by, first by militias in, in Libya and they were being sold to groups like Boko Haram, which led to the bring back our girls propaganda sham of Michelle Obama where all of these kids got taken captive after this fanatical group got heavy weapons. But they were also being shipped to Syria to support what was then being sold to us as this great Arab Spring revolution. It, and so Christopher Stevens, that's why he was in Benghazi. He was overseeing the rat line. That's why he was killed. And this is scarcely ever mentioned. Um, so I believe, again, this is another factor in Trump's victory. No Libya, it would be another reason, uh, if we put it in, in context, why Trump might not be there today. So back to Syria. We were sold on a, and I was sold, and I, I, I definitely wanted to believe it at first. And yeah, me too, were, absolutely. A lot of us. A lot of, and a lot of my colleagues wanted to believe it at first. That people were rising up, but not, not Elena Cobb, and, uh, you know, she knows, the re she knows you know, you're, you're a veteran. Anyway. Learn, learned from Afghanistan in the 1980s, which is what we all should have done. Yes, so, you know, this was never peaceful. I mean, there were reformist, peaceful protests. And in many of those protests, they were calling for reforms from the Assad government and not necessarily from regime change. And then there were events like in July 2011 in Jazeera al-Shagor, which is now occupied by uh, extreme jihadists in al-Qaeda-controlled territory in northeastern, northwestern Syria. Jazeera al-Shagor, over 80 Syrian army officers and conscripted soldiers were simply massacred just months after the rebellion had begun. So it was militarized from the start. The US begins to take these weapons in in 2012, brings heavy weapons in. Uh, by 2013, there, you're seeing um, BGM anti-tank missiles, tow missiles, like wire-guided missiles that can take out T-72 tanks that form the, the teeth of the Syrian Arab army. And Al-Qaeda Al is spreading. They're, be, they're able to take Raqqa. ISIS is spreading. And the US is watching. In fact, John Kerry admitted in a private discussion with Syrian opposition activists who were clamoring and begging him to bomb that we watched Al-Qaeda and we allowed them to advance because we believed it would frighten Assad into negotiating a transition. And what instead happened was a Russian intervention.
The Russian intervention happened for two reasons. ISIS was gaining steam, and number two, the um, tow missiles that the U.S. was shipping in through the Incirlik Air Base in Turkey into allowed al-Qaeda and its local affiliate, Jabhat al-Nusra, to capture Idlib and to move close to the Alawite heartland. And these are genocidal groups. These are groups who are openly saying, we want to slaughter the Alawites. We want to slaughter Christians. These are groups that in many cases had done so. In, and I document those cases in my book. These are, and these were our proxies. Our proxies want to slaughter religious minorities. Our proxies took Idlib, forced the Druze population to unbury their dead because they were buried improperly according to the extremist vision of Islamic law that Jabhat al-Nusra believed in. They forced the Christian population to convert at gunpoint or kill or, or die or, or leave. And they banned not just uh, women from the ability to not cover, they banned the ability of women to wear colorful hijab. And so and they banned music and they banned public singing and a process which has been seen in every area that the U.S. and its Gulf allies helped the Syrian opposition take what the scholar Joshua Landis, the leading Syria scholar in the U.S., calls Talibanization. And it's also what the U.S. had done in Afghanistan. So again, you see the R2P doctrine, which is supposed to protect civilians and is supposed to spread human rights, being turned on its head. Russia intervenes. And Russia, together with Iran, but it's primarily Russia and the Syrian Arab army, retake Palmyra from ISIS. This was one of the cities that ISIS had taken. It is the site of some of the greatest antiquities in the world. And ISIS was lynching archaeologists that had maintained these, these antiquities and carrying out public executions in the theater. And it was thanks to Russian intervention and the Syrian Arab army that Palmyra was retaken, at a, and I quote, at a State Department press conference. Um, State Department spokesman, I can't remember which doofus it was at the time, but he was asked, Do you, does the US support taking back Palmyra from ISIS? And he refuses to answer the question. And then he said, I didn't, and then the reporter said, I didn't hear an answer there. And he said, I know you didn't, because the US was not allowed to celebrate ISIS being rolled back. These were, in many ways, our proxies, and Russia was rolling them back. Ultimately, uh, Palmyra was taken again because Russia had to focus on five neighborhoods that were taken in East Aleppo. And that's when we were introduced to the White Helmets, a group that had been kind of, we'd known about for a long time, but I'd been starting to look into. But, you know, Aleppo was, five neighborhoods were occupied very, very violently by pretty much every militia, from Al-Qaeda's local affiliate to Arar al-Sham to you know, the Free Syrian Army, whoever they were. And the people in Western Aleppo did not want them there. I don't think the people of Washington, D.C. would want five militias living next door to them. The city was divided. They had you know, started destroying pub the public water supply. Electricity was being at the electricity grid was being attacked by them. They were lobbing mortars into West Aleppo. So Russia and the Syrian army embark on an operation to get them out. And that's when Samantha Power goes before the UN and deploys the same narrative we've heard ever since the end of the Cold War, we have to save the children. That's when we hear about the White Helmets. That's when they start getting nominated for a Nobel Prize. That's when celebrities are recruited by their PR arm, funded by a billionaire, Ayman Asfari, uh, to endorse the White Helmets publicly. Uh, that's when a film about them, made by Netflix, wins an Oscar. It wasn't even a very good film. It was kind of camp. Um, and the role of the White Helmets was to distract attention from the militias that had taken those five neighborhoods and make us think about rescuers and Assad killing his own people and these brave rescuers running to save the children. Maybe they did save children. I'm not denying that, that but this was also an influence operation in which the State Department provided some $30 million in advanced communications equipment, HD cameras, to the White Helmets to film those scenes. They were then conveyed back through its communication center in Turkey, and they supplied all of the US media, which was unable to get into Aleppo because they would be kidnapped or killed, as James Foley was, with all of these stories. And so you basically had an intelligence operation or an influence operation determining what we in the West saw through our corporate and mainstream media, and the White Helmets of course, only operated in areas controlled by these extremist militias. They were not the actual civil rescue corps 
of Syria. So when I introduced my article about all that, detailing how the US had funded them and the British had funded them and the Qataris had funded them and that they had actually worked on the ground with Al-Qaeda, I was mercilessly attacked and the attacks have simply not stopped. And you know, I think the big revenge was to try to get this book talk canceled. But these are facts and they're facts we need to be aware of because now that we've entered a new phase where the Trump administration is attempting a similar regime change, or another regime change operation against Venezuela and deploying a humanitarian interventionist narrative, attempting to convince us that we need to save Venezuelans from a humanitarian crisis with sanctions by sanctioning them. And you know, who knows, there's going to be a talk at um, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a big think tank in town on the 20th, on the feasibility of military intervention, featuring a who's who of US government and Trump officials. We need to understand how we're being deceived. And we're not going to be, we're going to be deceived by having our heartstrings tugged at. Even the Trump administration is going to use a narrative that appeals to liberals. And I think the white helmets, I mean, there, I talk about so many deceptions from Naira, the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter, um, to you know, so many other humanitarian deceptions. But this was the gold standard of this. Uh, this was the gold standard. This was the most powerful humanitarian interventionist deception ever deployed. And of course, how did it end? They were evacuated by the Israeli Shin Bet through the Golan Heights and sent to Jordan, um, at least and then ultimately to Canada. And there are a few white helmets uh, left. They are in Afrin, which was invaded by Turkey, and they're operating essentially as Turkish mercenaries. Again, we can't talk about this. Our whole media bought it. The Oscars bought it. The Nobel Prize Committee bought it. All of our elites fell into this titanic propaganda mechanism, and they want to sweep the whole thing under the rug, and I'm not going to let them do it. Well, just like Russiagate, which is what we began with and coming around full circle. And I'll just add that as someone who's been reporting for the past several years, actually for over four years now, since March 2015, on the U.S.-Saudi war on Yemen, which has unleashed the largest humanitarian catastrophe in the world, I'm still waiting for the U.S. government to fund the White Helmets in Yemen to show the world the, the complete destruction of historic areas in Yemen by Saudi Arabia, which is bombing civilian areas relentlessly, including a few days ago, they bombed a school full of young girls uh, with US and British bombs, with US planes that are full of US fuel that are being provided by the US military. Of course, while we're supposed to support humanitarian intervention in Syria, a few countries over, the US is helping Saudi Arabia, an, a theocratic absolute monarchy, unleash the largest humanitarian crisis and, and, on Earth. And the UN just recommended that Israel be investigated by the ICC for shooting journalists, the um, disabled children, and medics during the Great March of Return when people essentially marched uh, to the gates of their prison. And when do we hear about Palestinian medics? Where is the Nobel Prize for the Palestinian medics who were killed? When do we hear about Yasser Murtaja, the journalist who was killed with a press vest on, uh, who's actually whose footage we featured in our film, uh, my and Dan Cohen's film, Killing Gaza? Uh, you know, we're not going to hear about him. We'll hear about Jamal Khashoggi, because uh, that was the moment that the elite Policymakers in Washington, including Lindsey Graham, decided to start to criticize the special relationship for its own reasons. But we won't hear about this, and we have to explore these double standards in order to understand how we're being pushed. Yeah, and we'll conclude here. I'll make a final note and then let Max conclude. And just come full circle. We began talking about Russiagate, and we talked about how the national security state was driving this narrative to try to undermine Trump by refusing to engage with the roots that created Trumpism and gave birth to the far right. We were talking about those roots. So instead of talking about growing levels, historic levels of inequality, instead of talking about a war on immigrants who are being put in concentration camps that are privatized by corporations, instead of talking about the destruction of the EPA, we're talking about Russia controlling our elections and troll course, farms. the war in Syria, et cetera. Hey ben, but the troll farm is true. I mean, you have to admit, the troll farm is true. The Jesus masturbation memes. I mean, they, they convinced me to vote for, for We have Trump. children here. <laughs> we have children here. We can't talk about the troll farm pages. All right, but I'll conclude here, and I, there's a quote. This is in the intro, and I think it's a good way to come full circle. And really, I think 
the summary of it, which is the summary of the book, is the CIA is not your friend, right? And this is, this is the quote from Max that I'll let, give the mic to him to finish this event, and then we'll go to a Q&A. Max wrote, it should be considered a national outrage that so many of those who have position, positioned themselves as figureheads in the anti-Trump resistance were key architects of the disastrous interventions that helped set the stage for Trump and figures like him to gain power. So other far-right figures in Europe and throughout the world. But in the era of Russiagate and the war in Syria and the war in Libya, as we've been discussing, when so many liberals cling to institutions like the FBI and NATO and the CIA and et cetera as supposed guardians of survival, the dastardly record of America's national security mandarins has been wiped clean and those people have been turned into heroes. Max writes, this book, The Management of Savagery, Savagery will excavate their crimes and expose the cynicism behind the U.S. national security state's appeals to democratic values. Well, we can conclude I think here. we can go to Q&A on that. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Q&A. Questions, <laughs> comments, uh, heckling. Uh, it seems like the, uh, you mentioned the coup in Venezuela, it seems like it has failed, or at least plan A has failed which was to have the military defect to this Guaido character's side and have a sort of military overthrow. Uh, if it completely fails, uh, or even now that it's partially failed, what do you think that does in terms of Trump's credibility, the credibility of uh, US imperialism? Or it, it seems like it's been a huge embarrassment. And uh, what do you think that bears for the future, what significance it might have? Well, I think we have to look at the failure of the U.S. in Syria, where it was constantly uh, predicting that, declaring that Assad must go. And Mike Pompeo was actually asked at a briefing, I think two days ago, uh, by a reporter. I don't know who the reporter was. They said, uh, you constantly, the U.S. constantly said Assad must go. The Trump administration said Assad must go. He's still there. Uh, and now you're saying Maduro must go. How long will he be there? And Pompeo basically said, you know, I don't know how long it's going to be, but I can tell you that we're continuing to uh, weaken the state of Syria, in so many words, and that's what their strategy is for Venezuela. I was in Caracas for Donald Trump's speech in Miami before the Venezuelan uh, right-wing exile lobby, and you know there were you know people from Venezuela wearing Trump MAGA hats, which basically to all of us symbolize white supremacy. And I guess in their own country, they represent the same thing. They're basically the Venezuelan analog to the Syrian American Council. And Trump, in appealing to them, was actually auditioning a stump speech that he was going to use before the American public as a whole, um, predicting a possible challenge from Bernie Sanders or perhaps someone like Elizabeth Warren. And he pointed to Venezuela as an example of socialism's failure. Uh, he pointed to Venezuela as an exhibit or as a cudgel that he would use to bash Bernie Sanders over the head with and say, this is what Bernie Sanders will do to America. He will cause a humanitarian crisis in America. So from Donald Trump's point of view, uh, this kind of narcissistic figure who only cares about winning, having Venezuela, uh, having Maduro in power while Venezuela is facing sanctions that seek to place a blockade on its entire economy to the point where they're even embargoing ships that take oil to Cuba, where they're talking about sanctioning MasterCard and Visa, which would pre prevent average Venezuelans from going shopping. That will help him attack his opponents. Elliot Abrams might think about it differently. Uh, Pompeo might even think about it differently. But for Trump, it's about winning, and he can live with Maduro being still in power. And I would just point out in a piece we have at the Gray Zone, uh, we interviewed, uh, we had, um, Michael Selby Green, a contributor to us, interviewed um, interviewed um, Jaziri, what's his first name? The, basically, the special rapporteur at the UN on unilateral coercive measures, which is a reference to sanctions, who declared that the sanctions the US is applying on Venezuela will cause mass starvation. Um, and he said, it is the bluntest instrument for achieving regime change. And so there's a certain level of savagery of what the US is doing to Venezuela. We just spoke to 
a colleague, a journalistic colleague, Diego Sequeira, before we came and he said that the clap boxes, which are the boxes of essentially free food that the government distributes to the poor and helps feed six million people, uh, are missing some items. Six million this month. families. Six million over, families. Between 70 up to 90% of the population who gets food support from the government. And so we're essentially starving Venezuela to, in part, I think, achieve a domestic political goal for Trump, but to also obviously achieve the same geopolitical goals and economic goals that were at, at the heart of the Syrian regime change operation. And I'd point to one other thing, which is the cover of Time magazine. There's an article, I think it's by a journalist named Simon Schuster, and it shows these red spots on the world where Putin has stepped in. Putin is taking, he's not taking over the world, he's preventing the US from taking over the world by supporting what this journalist calls failing states. And of course, Venezuela is at the center of it, but there's also Syria. So you have these other powers in the world that are preventing the US from achieving regime change, which frustrates the US and I think contributed to the Russiagate narrative. The US failure in Syria contributed to the Russiagate narrative. Um, and we're gonna see more and more of that. That's the background noise of the Cold War. Uh, but what, when, we, when you actually step back and look at um, what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed and how many died, a million civilians in Iraq. I don't believe Iraq would have been possible if the Soviet Union were there. And another point is, I don't believe Libya would have been possible if Dmitry Medvedev wasn't there and Vladimir Putin had made that vote at the UN on the Security Council against it, which is one reason why Putin ran again. All of this, has, for him, a lot of this comes back to Libya. So I think we're looking increasingly at a multipolar world with Venezuela at the front line, reaching out to allies including Turkey, including India, but also Russia and China, the Caribbean states, uh, Mexico, Uruguay, who are sort of more neutral here, and we're seeing a different world emerge. So the question is, what kind of world are we at the dawn of? Right now, Venezuela will determine that. Uh, so Nicaragua abstained in the OAS yeah. vote yesterday. I'd like you to uh, talk about that. And also, Pence gave a speech to the UN trying to get uh, the opposition, you know, substituting. What's the prospects that that would succeed? I doubt it, but what's the pros What's How is it going to play out in the UN? Okay, great questions. And we had one in the back. Yeah, you, uh, you mentioned the AUMF, and uh, one of the things I've, I've read almost part of the first chapter of your book, one of the things I take away from this is that um, we have, with the intelligence community, a sort of unelected body of uh, technical experts that are uh, s supposed to be depoliticized. And from what I know about administrative law, they're, they're actually, the executive agencies are created in, in the hopes that they're going to be populated by depoliticized figures. It seems to me that one of the things you touch on um, is that these measures in, in our political and legal framework that de-emphasize democratic values and discourse inevitably end up supporting right-wing measures, both overseas and at home. I'm just wondering if you have any uh, response to that and sort of what you would say, what, what can be done politically sort of to push back against that reality. I'll address the Nicaragua question really quickly first. Um, that was, a, you know, the question was about Nicaragua abstaining at the OAS yesterday when um, essentially Colombia under U.S. pressure rammed through this resolution to strip, uh, to remove Venezuela's ambassador and impose the opposition uh, opposition's figure, Gustavo Torre, um, who is you know, a think tank fellow here at CSIS and is, uh, was actually implicated in an alleged assassination plot in 2014, a very savory figure. Um, and I, you know, I was puzzled a little bit by Nicaragua abstaining, but I know that what's taking place in Nicaragua right now is a national dialogue. Um, a, a, about a year ago, it began on April 18th, there was a, you know, what's known as a kind of golpe suave in Nicaragua, a soft coup. Um, you know, U.S.-backed civil society groups and groups that were increasing, uh, incredibly violent attempted to overthrow the government. The society suffered a lot. It went from, you know, 5% growth each year to 0% growth. Many people suffered on both sides. And Ortega's promise, Daniel Ortega's promise to his population is a robust economy, a growing economy, and social programs. And so in this national dialogue, he has released virtually everyone um, to 
the chagrin of his popular base in the Sandinista movement in order to try to get out from the NICA Act, these US, this big round of US sanctions that were imposed, including violent figures like Medardo Mairena, who was wanted in Costa Rica on human trafficking charges and who oversaw the violent tranques that basically tore parts of Nicaragua apart, saw people burned alive, raped, killed. Um, and so I suspect that the abstention at the OAS is of a part with this, that Nicaragua is sort of trying to stay out of the U.S.'s way in hopes of relieving sanctions because Nicaragua's economy, I mean, if they can't export some cigars or some fruit, if, there's, if tariffs are raised a little bit, that has a terrible effect on the economy. The one thing Nicaragua has that Venezuela doesn't have is food sovereignty. They have 70 or they produce 70 to 80 percent of their own food. That's Venezuela's big weakness is it's a petro state. They don't have an agricultural base and so they depend so much on imported food. Um, on your, just the second part of your question, then I'll take the other question. Uh, so if I, we do have to get out of here soon. I want to be sensitive to the people working here. And I also want to thank them if we could do a round of applause books, really quickly. So yeah, Max is going to sign books. And, and all of the um, sales will be donated, uh, the proceeds will be donated to an uh, organization that supports free speech that has a really long acronym that I forgot. Um, <laughs> Freedom with yeah, EA. Anyway. All right, well, I'm going to answer the question to the best that I can. I don't remember exactly everything you said. This is about intelligence agencies and politicization. I think actually it could be an appropriate way to end here really quickly because it kind of summarizes Max's book. And yeah, ostensibly intelligence agencies are, are supposed to be apolitical. But I think that actually is the heart of the issue, right? And we need to problematize what it means to be apolitical. In the context of the US, supporting US imperialism, supporting NATO, supporting neoliberal capitalism, supporting the IMF and the World Bank and austerity, that is being apolitical, that is being neutral, that is considered, if, if you support those policies, as a journalist, as a government operative, you are neutral, right? You are moderate. You're nonpartisan. And that is the whole point is that, you know, there's this longstanding joke that, the, that CIA really stands for capitalism's invisible army. And that is really one of the points of this book is that the intelligence agencies are the, the warriors that maintain U.S. imperialism abroad. They prop up the U.S. empire through supporting all of these unsavory far-right groups throughout the world, and even some domestically, as we've seen police infiltration with uh, far-right fascist white supremacist groups. So the point is that this blowback that we've seen from empire is something that we've seen again and again and again. We saw it as we discussed in Afghanistan, we saw it with 9-11, with Iraq, Libya, and Syria. We saw it with Donald Trump, with the, right, the rise of far-right groups in Europe. So, yeah, I mean, I don't remember exactly what your question was, but the point is that these are the apolitical intelligence agencies, and they are not our friends, and when they say that they're apolitical and depoliticized and neutral, all they're there to do is to prop up the U.S. empire and to serve the interests of the capitalist class of the 1% of the billionaires who really control the U.S. and this world, and the Forbes 400, those are the people that the intelligence community represents. So if they call themselves depoliticized, that's it gets beside them. And they're not necessarily that intelligent or a community. <laughs> uh, it's called the American Booksellers for Free Expression, and I, you know, again, thank uh, Brian and the Justice Center and Politics and Prose and all of your proceeds from buying my book will go to this wonderful organization. And you know, if you want to support the Justice Center, Kay can tell you how. Yeah, and thanks to all the staffers who helped organize this and for security. Let's do a round of applause for them.